Ring Around the Rosy, Three Blind Mice, and Humpty Dumpty. All innocent nursery rhymes, right? Well, what if I told you that those rhymes and more have some very dark beginnings? Hey, Wanderers! Welcome back to another Foolish Wanderers podcast, the podcast about anything and everything. Today, we're going to be taking a look at some of the dark backstories to famous kids' nursery rhymes. Alrighty, so we're going to start with one that, I think this was the first nursery rhyme that I grew up like hearing that I realized or heard that had like a very twisted backstory. Same. All the older, older kids at Sunday school said it was about dead kids. So. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So the first one we're going to be talking about is Ring Around the Rosie. So if you haven't heard this nursery rhyme, it goes, Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Which, like, when a bunch of kids are saying it, I guess it can be, like, creepy. Chanting or- it. Ch- it's so <laughs> scary. Chanting is creepy. But, like, when you're a kid and singing it, it's just, like, a fun little nursery rhyme. You're, like, like hop in the You don't know what like, any of it means. No, you like, you're a kid. Uh, no. Yeah. Which is kind of messed up because either like older kids made these up or adults taught these to kids, which is even more messed up. Because if all these rhymes have messed up beginnings, like who's coming up with these? Like what adult is like, sing this, children, just in a circle and sing this. Like that's weird. <laughs> mm-hmm. In my head, for like the defense of why the kids sing it i'm like maybe it's like these stories that the adults come up with to try and relate or Mm -hmm. teach something like a topic like death to children yeah but then i mean what's the point because they don't understand yeah like if you're not they really grasp the full idea so it's like why let them sing like a chanting about dead like ashes ashes we all fall down exactly that's the weird part to me it's like because yeah you could teach your kids about you know morbid things right to get them used to things and not have them freak out right to prepare them but when you like make it sound fun that's weird to me right like when you when you <laughs> you're like oh have fun with this children <laughs> like that's weird <laughs> it's weird it's my weird. advice is just let the peppa pig teach them <laughs> i've never seen peppa pig i know the character but it creeps me out. I can't stand the art style. It creeps me out. It's so... The art style is really gross. It is. Yeah, I It's can't. really, like, rud- It's gross meaning, like, rudimentary. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like it. I mean, it does, like, remind me of kids' drawings, but I just... I can't. I, I, I can't. All right, so now going back into the history of Ring Around the Rosie. So, after World War II, folklorists... Folklorists is a weird word. I'm sorry. That's a weird folklore occupation. Yeah, you study folk, folk, folklore, folklore, no, folklorist, folklorists. Yeah, that's a uh, yeah. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a word. <laughs> folklorists theorized that the rhyme's origin dated back to medieval Europe. Scholars saw similarities between the rhyme's cryptic lyrics and the circumstances surrounding the deadly plague that swept across Europe and killed millions of people. The black plague, the bubonic yeah. plague. Yep. That's what we're talking about. Yes, ma'am. So folklorists, folklorists thought that the ring around the rosy rhyme referred to a red circular rash common in some forms of the plague. So like different variants of the plague would mm-hmm. have this red rash. The posies would have represented the different flowers and herbs people carried to ward off the disease. It's like, you know, because they didn't really have medicines, so they'd use different herbs and things to either cover I up also, the smell or... Yeah, you know, they'd cover up the smell of, like, the dead bodies decaying in the <laughs> streets and... Uh, yeah, and so, like, yeah. So, like, so, like, like, an attempt to, like, protect them from the illness and stuff. They'd have different flowers and things. Um, so the ashes, or a tissue, said in some versions, um, and falling down was supposed to mimic the sneezing and eventually dying from the disease. So you have a bunch of these kids running in a circle, singing about a red rash and then dying. Pretty messed up. It's great. It's great. And then burning um, herbs and flowers to cover up the smell. The smell of death. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Well, let's. So, like, you know, like those um, doc, play doctor masks, the ones that look like bird beaks? The, the, with, like, the leather yeah. bound with the bird beaks. I so hate they would those. put. Yeah. They're so creepy, but they're they so would gross. put. 
like herbs and different mm-hmm. like spices in that beak. Yep. As like a quote for them, quote like fil- filtration system yeah. to try and filter out either probably the germs, the sickness, mm-hmm. or this probably more the smell. Yeah, it was like it's mostly more the smell, I think. But um, I think the mask might have helped them in some ways, at least as some more than the herbs stuffed in the nose of it <laughs> would help. That them. mask is so scary, though. It is. It's just. A, it is a the weird... perfect Halloween costume. It is. It's- it's terrifying. I grew up mm-hmm. hating that. Even like um, looking at like gas masks from like World War One and Two, I can't terrifying. stand. I can't stand. Have you them. seen the? Um, I think they're for. I'm pretty sure it's for the World War Two ones. Mm-hmm. But it's a Mickey Mouse gas mask. Ew. That so it's it's like it looks like a Mickey Mouse face, and then it's for kids. That's what their <sighs> reasoning behind the marketing was to make it kid friendly. Because it's like, oh, it's Mickey Mouse. I gotta look this up. It's so scary. Oh, ew. That's even worse. It looks like an apocalyptic video game character. I hate it. Yeah, it does. Well, like, Mickey Mouse back then was terrifying, too. (laughs) When they first, like, created Disneyland, you know? Their mascots were creepy. Yeah. They really (laughs) are. Anyways, so continuing back on the theories to bring around the rosy... Um, it's said that more recent folklorists argue that the connection between the, the poem and the plague is overstated. So I originally, like when I first heard about this, like the backstory about it, it was always about the plague. However, they say it's not necessarily about the plague. They said that the red ring around the neck is not all that common, actually, of the plague. So they also argue that if the rhyme had been created way back then in the medieval period, its lyrics would have been like changed drastically for like what how we say it. So like some of the first recorded versions of this rhyme date back to the late 1800s, and today's versions are very different from those even. So mm-hmm. things could have been changed from if they've changed even from the 1800s, it's changed drastically from the medieval times. So it's kind of hard to say exactly where it came from. But I think it's probably about the plague, because that's, about the plague. yeah, because it's there is some connection, and I'm sure some lingo has been changed somewhere. But it's it started about that time, and then yeah, there's connections. So yeah, it's probably about it's the like plague. a big, but it's about it's like a big game of telephone, basically. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the next rhyme that I have is "Rockabye Baby." Have you have, uh, have you heard this I've one? heard of it, but I've never. I thought it was really weird. It is, yeah, and sad. So yeah. I've never looked into the origin of this. Yeah, a lot of these rhymes, like I don't, I know, it's so like the ones that I sang were like "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star." You know, that's that's what I said all the time. I have heard of this one, obviously, but it wasn't like singing it as a kid. <laughs> So Rockabye Baby goes, Rockabye Baby in the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When when the bow breaks, the cradle will fall, and down will come baby, cradle and all. Which in itself is terrifying because you're talking about a baby Awful. falling out of a tree. And dying. And dying basically, yeah. Mm-hmm. So there are several several stories that can explain where this rhyme came from. So the first one says that it came from real life Kenyan family of Derbyshire, England. So back in the seventeen hundreds. Kate and Luke Kenyon and their eight children made their home. That's a lot of kids. That's a lot of kids, especially for back then. That's a lot of kids. They made their home in a hollowed out yew tree. Y-E-W. So the tree that they made their house out of was massive and old, even for then. So they said it was probably at least 2,000 years old. The tree? The tree, like when they made their house in it. Yeah, it's like 2,000 years old. So according to legend, the Kenyans hollowed out one of the branches of the tree and made it into a cradle for one of their babies. It t- tucked safely into the tree branch, the child will be lulled lud- to sleep by the movement of the tree in the wind. Apparently, the yew tree still exists in the woods outside Derbyshire, but was damaged in the 1930s when vandals lit a fire in it. So- Man, these people are living like Keebler elves. <laughs> <laughs> the original Keebler elves. Yeah, but I mean, like, that'd be kind of cool to- if it was, like, a big enough tree. That'd be kind of cool. You know, like, have, Fire like- hazard. I don't like well, it. Well, yeah, but I mean, if there's nothing else you can use as a house besides, like, a cave or something, I mean- I live in a cave. I'm a cave really- person. <laughs> a cave dweller. <laughs> there's two kinds of people in this world. A cave person or a tree person and i am a cave person i'm probably more of a tree person yeah guys. you're definitely more of a tree person <laughs> you are a cheery sunshiny person oh thank you i appreciate it <laughs> and i got called a curmudgeon multiple times from professors in college oh my goodness so, <laughs> i remember you came hold, hold, like back to our apartment and told me that and i was laughing i was very confused but it was so funny you're just like my professor just called me a curmudgeon I'm like what the heck is that 
<laughs> basically. I think Kat looked it. I think Kat looked it up. Yeah, it isn't it like basically like a hermit or something like that? No, yeah. is that a hermit? I mean, look it up right now. <laughs> it's just like a. It's not a okay. good thing to be called. No, it's not it's when not. you're tw- when you're in your early twenties. No, I mean, yeah, I'm kind of like that. <laughs> What does it say, Kendra? Okay, curmudgeon is a crusty, <laughs> ill-tempered, and usually an old man. See, you're not crusty because you're a very clean person. Very clean. Very I'm very yes. Yeah, I have great hygiene. Yeah. A bad. This is better. A bad-tempered, difficult, cantankerous person. I mean, when you were like in senior year, you were. I was. You didn't really upset. give a shit. Yeah, yeah, I was very upset. Yeah. So I mean. I can see that where you're just kind of like you didn't care if anybody like if you said something you like obviously you weren't rude about it but like you didn't care like what critiques you'd give. I was very blunt. You're very blunt. So <laughs> which sometimes it is says, needed. Of, it says fickle and stubborn. That would <laughs> I think stubborn. that's ve- I'm very stubborn. I mm-hmm. think that would yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah, different yeah, versions no. kind of mix it together. Yeah. Yeah, I got to like yeah, like what is it? Like year 4, year 3. Year three, and I was like, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I think it was like halfway through like year three, and then you're like, oh, I don't care. I'm like, every, yeah, I'm like, this is, yeah. Or very beginning. I mean, point. I didn't care, but I cared about my work. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I stopped caring about the professors and the students. Yeah, like the overly critiques, the-, the things that the students would say that wouldn't make sense. There's a lot of that. I got sick. This is a better way to put it. I got sick of the fluff. Yeah, I can see that. In the dance. The dance. And the game. <laughs> the game of life. Just kidding. That's what I got sick of. Yeah. All right. So, on to the next theory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to transition to that. I don't know how to transition to that either. <laughs> <laughs> right. so the next origin i have for rock baby claims that the lyrics were based on the written observations of a pilgrim boy who was came over to the new world the young child witnessed native american moms placing their infants in sturdy cradles from birch bark the cradles were hung from the tree's low branches so the soothing motion of the wind would gently rock the babies to sleep i mean it's a kind of an interesting idea i mean you don't have like the cribs and things we have now like those what are they call like bouncers or rockers or whatever so, I mean, I don't know what the babies do. I don't know. You put up like these things and they make bounce. So, I mean, it makes sense. As a baby, I laid on the floor and did nothing. <laughs> All right. And the last origin story I have for Rockabye Baby is that the rhyme was not even supposed to be a nursery rhyme at all. Instead, it was an allegory about the political unrest of the time. So, it was supposedly penned and like written in a British pub during the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And yes, it was named the Glorious Revolution. I was just going to comment on that, but... <laughs> That's his like, actual nickname. So, the lyrics refer to... The lyrics could refer to the new heir to the throne born to King James II of England and actually expressed the hope that the infant prince would die so that the king reign of King James II would be overthrown. Oh which is my pretty messed gosh! Up. You're like wishing her on a on baby, a baby. Which is really messed up. That's messed up. Yeah. That's one thing I never, I'm sure I've said it many times. We've probably said it multitudes of times on this podcast. Hurting children, especially like when they can't even like speak or do anything. Sick like Sick person. It's, it's extremely messed up and evil. So yeah. yeah, but that's yeah. They deserve to. They deserve to be get to get turned into one of Inca's dog toys and <laughs> part by her multiple times. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, even like nowadays, you know, when I just I can't fathom hurting, especially a kid. Mm-hmm. It's so messed up. Okay, so speaking of messed up, the next one we have is London Bridge. So London Bridge goes, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. London Bridge is falling down, my fair lady. It's kind of a lazy rhyme. <laughs> it is. It is. But as a kid, you're like, wait, this is kind of messed up, right? Like the bridge is falling. Maybe you don't comprehend it, but oh, it's still I, like I, lazy. I did not. Me, myself, never comprehended it. You didn't? Okay. No. Well, good. <laughs> So, the main theory about where this one started was, or the most commonly accepted origin story for this rhyme, is that the London Bridge was falling down in ten, or the year 1014 because Viking leader Olaf Haraldsson allegedly pulled it down during an invasion of the British Isles. And he was a Viking, so he pulled it down yes. with his bare hands. Oh, yes, very strong. <laughs> 
Though the reality of the attack has never been proven, the tale of it inspired a collection of Old Norse poems written in 1230, containing a verse that sounds very close to the nursery rhyme. It translates to London Bridge is broken down, gold is won, and bright renown. See, they're not lazy. <laughs> they actually got some flourishes yeah, in there. Yeah, flourishing. Some mm, spice. It's beautiful. You know, the spice in there. However, this wasn't the only event that could have inspired the London Bridge rhyme. Part of the bridge was damaged in 1281 due to ice damage, and it was weakened by multiple fires in the 1600s, including the Great Fire of London in 1666, which I just looked at that, and that's a very bad number, so that makes sense. <laughs> Oh, uh-huh. okay. yep. So, all right. So, I have another theory as well. So, despite all of its structural failures, the London Bridge survived for 600 years and never actually fell down, as the nursery rhyme implies. When it was finally demolished in 1831, it was only because of it was more cost effective to replace it rather than keep repairing. Wait, it. I thought that London Bridge is in Arizona now. Like it was moved. I think one of them is it. This one. I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't know. I know there's one that they moved. Yeah, there's one but... that moved. Let's look it up. Okay, <laughs> Google time. So this is the London Bridge from 1831, and yeah, this is this one. This is this one. Yeah, this one. Oh this my one gosh! Like, demolished it is. in 1831. No, that's cool. So uh, in 1962, they sold. It was sold by the city yeah. of London to Lake okay. Havasu City in Arizona, and then moved. So they wait. So they demolished it, and then they moved it. Maybe they years did. Later? Maybe they took it down, but still had like a lot of it. I don't know, like, he's just, I have no idea. Okay, because, yeah, because this one was demolished in 1831, but, okay, that's pretty cool. I, although, I suppose, yeah, because you'd have to take it apart and then move it, like, you couldn't just ship a whole bridge, you'd have to <laughs> rebuild it, so mm-hmm. I guess that makes sense. That's cool. All right, so, building off of that one, so, the, the one dark theory behind the bridge's longevity, so why this bridge lasts so long, some people say that they were bodies encased in his moorings, or like where you tie the boats to it, like secure boats to it. Bodies? So, bodies, like people were buried in it. I mean, maybe like workers that died, because there are a lot of workers that yeah, died yeah. doing, you know, amazing building, like, building anything. anything back then, especially back then. Yeah, yeah. Well, so the author of the book, The Traditional Games of England, Scotland, and Ireland, Alice Ruther Gome, suggests that the London Bridge is Falling Down rhyme refers to to a use of a medieval punishment known as live entombment. Entombment is when a person is encased into a room with no openings or exits and basically left there to die, which is very messed up. Oh my. It's very gross. That's a nightmare <laughs> that I, nope, nope, that'd be so awful. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the live entombment was a form of punishment as well as a form of sacrifice. Gome points to the lyric that take the key and lock her up, part of the rhyme, as a nod to its inhumane practice and the belief that the sacrifices may have been children. No. That's extremely messed up. So, according to her, people during those times believed that the bridge would collapse if there was not a body buried inside. Why? I don't know. <laughs> Thankfully, this disturbing suggestion has never been actually proven, and there's no like evidence that suggests this is true. So they like, haven't found any human remains in this bridge, that's really which is very really good. Really icky, but that's really messed up. It's yeah, the thought of being buried alive. Nope. Ugh, gross, 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 gross. Drowning and bur- being buried alive are my two biggest. Uh, yeah, both well, are not good. Nope. <laughs> All right. This so next one is Jack and Jill. So Jack and Jill went up a hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, and Jill came tumbling after. So one popular interpretation of the rhyme is that it tells the story of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette during the French Revolution. King Louis was beheaded, aka lost his crown, during his reign. Shortly after, Marie Antoinette was also beheaded, so hence came tumbling after. But she's not Jill! Well, they renamed them oh. Jack and Jill. <laughs> Neither of them are Jack and Jill. <laughs> it's King Louis and Marie Antoinette. <laughs> so, although the story seems to fit quite well, some have pointed out that the earliest known printing of the rhyme actually predates their reign. Mm. So it kind of knocks that one out. It still makes sense, but it kind of knocks it out. So another theory comes from a small town in Somerset called Kilmerston. This is in the UK. So there's an actual hill now called Jack and Jill Hill, that locals believed inspired the nursery rhyme. Their story involves a young couple, Jill, a local spinster, and Jack, her mysterious lover. In this version of events, Jill becomes pregnant by Jack, and the couple is overjoyed. 
but when Jack goes up the hill to collect some water from the well, he is tragically killed by a dislodged boulder. Like crushed like Indiana Jones or? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Ooh. Yep. So Jill then dies later of a broken heart shortly after. And then the small town of Kilmerston band together to raise Jack and Jill's son together. So basically the whole town came together and took care of the, the infant. So today there are actually six stone markers that line the hill each with a verse of the poem. At the top of the hill, there's a well and a plaque dedicated to Jack and Jill, as well as two tombstones. You can actually go visit this. Like, this is a real thing. Oh, so this next yeah. slide. Yeah. So I'll have this eventually on the Instagram at Foolish Wanderers Podcast. Uh, but yeah, it's an actual well you can go see. You can look at all these plaques and everything. And yeah, you can go look at the well. I don't think this is the actual well that he would supposedly no, have gotten it's just water. Like a touristy thing, I'm assuming. I think so, yeah. But yeah, so that's the legend of that town. It's kind of cool. Sad, but interesting. <laughs> yeah, sad. So, crown. That so, sad. in that, if in that version, a crown would be like the crown of his head. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. He broke his crown. Yeah, crown of your head. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, either way, like you know, if it's, it could have been changed too. Like it could have been like kind of a rhyme, and then they changed it after mm-hmm. um, King Louis and Marie Antoinette were beheaded. Yeah. That could have happened too. So it's hard to say where it came from, but yeah. Okay. So the next one that I have is Humpty Dumpty. This rhyme always kind of creeped me out as a kid. I don't know. I think it's just I always like, saw it as an egg. Ugh. Like it's yeah. always um, depicted as an egg, an egg man. Yeah. And it creeps me out. Usually. I think it's, is it Mother Goose? There's a rhyme. There's a some publication of this, uh, of this rhyme where they, they basically interpreted it as a chubby child, which is even more messed up <laughs> because he falls and basically dies. And that's very sad. So, but this is how the rhyme goes. So Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So, yeah, it's very gross. So some say that Humpty Dumpty is a sly allusion to King Richard III, whose brutal 26-month reign ended in his death in which the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. In this version, King Richard III's horse was supposedly called Wall, W-A-L-L, off of which he fell during battle. So he fell off his horse named Wall. Mm-hmm. Sat on a wall. <laughs> yep. And he was then bludgeoned to death. He was bludgeoned so severely that his men could not save him, becoming the last king to die in battle. Oh, yeah. I like... that's it. That makes sense, right? It makes sense. Had a great yeah. fall and then the king's men and they couldn't put him together. Back together. <sighs> that's just... A, oh, I can't... And he was bludgeoned, you know... <laughs> like a cracked egg can't put it in you know. yeah so that one makes sense that one's pretty solid yes, yeah. um so historians long thought that king richard iii was humpbacked so shakespeare even perpetuated this myth famously portraying him as a poisonous bump backed toad in his historical play <laughs> which was first performed in the early 1600s the 2012 discovery of king richard iii's skeleton beneath a parking lot in leicester i believe is how you say it was led led to an updated diagnosis of severe scoliosis, which meant one shoulder of the king's might have been a little higher, so he would have been humpbacked. So, so Humpty Dumpty. Humpback. Yep. Hump, okay. Mm-hmm. The skeletal remains also showed evidence of a love of 11 wounds, eight of which were to the skull. Yep. Cracked so like that kind of solidifies them. Yep, exactly. Yep, so that one kind of solidifies See, that one right there. See, this one is like, this is this one makes sense. This one is like, has some solid... Yeah, this one like, has pretty good Instead of like, Jack and Jill is King Louis <laughs> and Mary Antoinette. Yeah, I mean, this one's pretty solid. Mm-hmm. This is probably why it creeped me out as a kid anyways, because it's probably true. I, it just creeped um, me out because it was an Eggman. It's an Eggman. <laughs> yeah. So a more recently popular theory attached to Humpty Dumpty is to a cannon in Colchester, England. It's like an actual cannon used in war. So during the town's siege in 1648, the town had a majestic castle and several churches encircled by a protective wall. A large and heavy cannon nicknamed Humpty Dumpty was strategically placed atop St. Mary's as a wall ch- as the wall church to defend the city. It was manned by one-eyed Jack Thompson. One-eyed. <laughs> One eyed Jack Thompson. That sounds like a cowboy name. Sounds like a <laughs> Broadway like actor's name. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the top of the church tower was hit by the em- enemy, causing the cannon to tumble into the ground where it shattered and could not be put back together again. So I still think King Richard's story makes more sense because than a cannon. Why would you name a cannon Humpty Dumpty? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the King Richard yep, one. Yeah, it's the King Richard one. Yep. 
The next one I have is Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush, which again is like, isn't this like one where you like dance in a circle and you hop around with your friends and you sing this? I think this is one of those two. I don't know if I've heard this one. Okay, so this one goes, Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush in a cold and frosty morning. So this one's not really dark. It's just kind of has some weird beginnings. Okay, so the rhyme was first recorded by James Orchard Halliwell, and it was an English children's game in the mid-19th century. So R.S. Duncan, a prison governor governor at H.M. Prison Wakefield in Wakefield, West Yorkshire, England. That's a long name. (laughs) That is a long (laughs) name. (laughs) Very long name. Suggested that the nursery rhyme was about female Victorian prisoners exercising in the yard at Wakefield. A mulberry tree grew in the yard, and women and inmates, like, I think they said they had children too sometimes, uh, they would dance around the tree with the children to sing the song. So, the, actually, the tree still stood until 2019. So, you could have gone and seen it, but it, I think they had to cut it down in 2019 because I got sick and died. Mm-hmm. But So, it was actually a tree in this courtyard. Uh, The other version of the possible history of it was that the rhyme is a reference to Britain's struggle to produce silk. Silkworms eat mulberry leaves, and during the 18th and 19th centuries, Britain tried to emulate the process of Chinese silk production. So they basically tried to beat the Chinese at their own game, (laughs) basically. However, Britain's cold winters with frost proved to be very harsh for the mulberry trees, too harsh to thrive, and this hampered the development of the successful silk production industry. So, so maybe it was the workers that were singing this song? Yeah, like if they were like trying to go check on the silkworms and it was mm-hmm. cold. Uh, yeah, because like on a cold and frosty morning, it makes sense. Yeah, it makes you're, sense. Like, trying to go around, check on them, and it doesn't work. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So, yeah, so that's, I think that one makes more sense than like people running around a mulberry bush in a prison yard. Both could work unless they're singing the song that these silkworm producers sang or something. Maybe that's what happened. Maybe it got passed down or something. But yes. All right, and the last one they have is Mary, Mary, quite contrary. So, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. I didn't think I really heard this one. I've heard it, but I don't think I remember, like, saying it at all as a kid. I don't remember this one at all. I know the Peter, yeah. Peter, Pumpkin Eater. That one's creepy. I, I like one. that one. What do you? <laughs> yeah. I should have looked that one up. Dang. Peter, Pumpkin Eater. I could do that one quick, too. Had a wife and couldn't keep her. Put her in a pumpkin shell. And there she sat very well. Yeah. There is, so when I used to go visit my aunt, she um, lived in a town where they had this kind of like a theme park for kids. It's called Storybook Land. I used to love it as oh, a kid. Oh! Is that, I think they have like the Wizard of Oz and you yep. walk through. My cousins, yep. my little cousins, they love that place. They've it been was, there. They like, like camping trip up there with oh, their cool. family. You know? Nice. Yeah, we used to go there all the time when we visited her. Uh, it was just scary because, like, like Kendra said, the Wizard of Oz thing. You'd walk in through this house, and it's um, you walk through, and it basically emulates a tornado going through. So that's scary because I'm terrified of tornadoes. Mm-hmm. So it's like a kid walking through that. I was like, my brother and I would like run through it because we couldn't stand like hearing the sounds and everything, and people yelling like, "Oh, GM, oh, GM!" It was like it freaked us out. So we we're like <laughs> be lining out. But like then you like walk through this whole trail of like yellow brick road and it's like the trees have faces on them for like the tree talking trees and then once you get towards the end you can see the witch's castle and then there's like flying monkeys in the trees it's really cool so if you ever want to look it up it's storybook land it's pretty cool um, but they also have things like um, the kittens with their mittens like they have little dioramas of those or like Peter Peter pumpkin eater they just have a giant pumpkin that you walk into <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty fun. Yeah, going back to Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Um, it's said that the Mary that is portrayed in this nursery rhyme is none other than Mary Tudor, also known as Bloody Mary. Oh. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so this one gets kind of dark, pretty dark, actually. So Mary was a daughter of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. She's mm-hmm. also the first wife of Henry VIII. It seems that in, attempt, in an attempt to break away from the Church of England, she tried to revert back to the Catholic Church as soon as she became queen. It was said that she was that she persecuted and murdered many Protestants. Her reign of terror became widely known over the course of history, thus giving her the well-deserved title of Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. And that's what you're like. That's what Thank Bloody them. Mary is when you say it in the mirror. I've never done that, and I'm terrified to do it. So I'm not doing that. Even <laughs> as a I'm not doing that game. So there are several inter- interpretations of what people think the meaning of this poem was. Some say that the silver bells stood for Catholic Church cathedral bells, the cockle shells tr- stood for the pilgrimage to Spain, and the pretty maids in a row stood for a row of nuns. And then others claim 
that the meaning about that the meaning was about torturing her victims. So silver bells stood for thumb screws that were torture devices. Oh, eh. yeah. Cockle shells that were a genital torture device. That makes sense. <laughs> And pretty maids in a row stood for people lining up to be executed by the mm. Halifax gibbet, which is What's that? basically a guillotine. Ugh. Yeah, so very disgusting. As for how does your garden grow, it is said to refer to the cemetery. With the more people she killed, the cemetery or garden would grow bigger. It could also be that she was barren. She couldn't oh, have okay. any children. Yeah, yeah. Like miscarriages. So it might have been like that. Like she wasn't able to have kids. So garden, you know. Yeah, that could be that too. There's there's a lot of different things you could associate with this. Mm-hmm. But yes, yeah, so this one gets very dark. This is dark. <laughs> this is dark. I it mean, should not be. You heard about thumb screws and cockle things. Ugh. Ugh. Gross, gross, gross. Nope, nope, nope. Very gross. So, yeah, so children's rhymes. I thought that was really. That was interesting. Thanks, yeah. It's. When you look into some of these rhymes, it gets dark fast. <laughs> Even like if you look at like old fairy tales and stuff, like the Brother Grimm. Oh, those tales. are dark too. Very dark. Before like Disney got a hold of like Cinderella and Rapunzel. I'm so glad that they did, and everyone else should mm-hmm. be too. Yeah, because it gets so dark if you read the originals. Yeah, mm-hmm. Disney does a pretty good job <laughs> keeping it family friendly. Excellent too. job. Yep, yep. Do you want me to look up the pumpkin eater one? I want to see if there's a history behind that one. Sure. Okay, let me see. Okay, so I found I did a quick Google search for Peter Peter pumpkin eater. So it says that it was originally from England. It was published in Great Britain in the late 18th century. Then in 1825, the verse was published in Boston, Massachusetts. So the first probability of like the origin of this rhyme was it said it said to um, said to be about a chastity belt. So Peter was married. What? To- <laughs> so it says that Peter was married to a woman who was unfaithful to him. Iron underwear was called a pumpkin shell. This cloth- <laughs> <laughs> This pumpkin. This Wait, clothing. does that mean that the the meow is called a pumpkin? No, I think it's just like it looks like a big like diaper, basically. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> it looks like a pumpkin. So this clothing item that some husbands forced their wives to wear was locked. The key was then kept in the husband's pocket. Oh god, that's really gross. And that's disgusting. Up. That's really gross. Um, so then the second theory uh, says that it could be about murder. Which, that's what I always thought it was about. I always thought it was that, too. Yeah, so it says that Peter's wife was a prostitute against her husband's wish. He killed his wife and then hid the body inside of a pumpkin, which has to be a massive pumpkin. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so those are two of the potential origins of this. I don't understand. It kind of seems really dumb to me that the second story was, like, Peter's wife was a prostitute, so he had to kill her. (laughs) Like, she doesn't have, like... None, nothing in the story says that she was a prostitute. No, nothing at all, no. Maybe Peter was just, you know, a jackass, and he killed his wife. Or evil, yeah. hmm Oh, here's another version. Um, it says that it could also be about the 13th century English king, King John, who famously bricked a rebellious noble's wife into a wall to starve to death or entombment. So that makes sense, too. It's his like, name's not Peter. No, but it was Peter's wife. <laughs> oh, it was Peter's wife. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can find another one. That There's a dark. lot of articles. That's dark too, yeah. What was, oh yeah, the movie of like James and the Giant Peach. That always freaked me out too. It was like, I think it's just because like it's a giant fruit and a giant pumpkin. I always equated the two, so it freaked me out. Um, although, so like, okay, so the original rhyme for Peter Peter is Peter Peter Pumpkin Eater had a wife and couldn't keep her. He put her in a pumpkin shell and there he kept her very well. Mm-hmm. So like the last line makes you think that like he provided for her, right? Or is he hiding her body very well? I thought well? it was that. I thought it was like... <laughs> it could I be. thought it was more like, very well. Like, Just that's like, the end of the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> very well. Yeah. The end. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what it seems like. It's like everyone's... It was just weird because, like, the artwork you look at, it's, like, her living in this pumpkin with, like, a cute window. She wasn't living in there. No. She was dead. Yeah, which is weird because, like, all this artwork is, like, her living nicely, but in reality it's probably because he hit her body in a giant pumpkin. Uh Uh-huh. That's really gross. Yep. Gross, gross, gross. Should we end this podcast on a happier note with a weird fun fact? (laughs) Yes, please. (laughs) Nothing about cockle shells, thumb screws, and or dead kids. Okay. I know that's going to be hard for you to find something that doesn't matter. <laughs> <those things>, but... <laughs> okay, here I found one already. 
Buckle up for this one. So cornflake in the shape of Illinois sold on eBay for guess how much, Kendra? Five thousand dollars? Oh no, that's way too much. It was only it was a, like a sale price of a thousand three hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> that's still really good. It's you know what? I, the only thing I have to say: hmm. good for you. Yes, yes. Good for whoever sold that and got that bread. Here that is go. hilarious. That's great. Here, I have a little backstory to this one. That's hilarious. <laughs> so, in two thousand and eight, two Virginia sisters found a cornflake that was shaped like the state of Illinois. It sold on eBay for one thousand three. $350 to Monty Kerr, the owner of Trivia website from Austin, Texas. He explained that he wanted the special piece of cereal for his traveling museum. Quote, we are starting a collection of pop culture and Americana items, he told the Associated Press. We thought it was a fantastic one. So yep, he bought it for his little traveling museum. Yes. So I hope you're doing well, Monty Kerr. I have to go because I have to go look through the box of Special K to see if I have anything <laughs> in the shape of... Of, like, different states. Florida. Florida. Oh, yep. goodness. Or, cool. like, do you have, like, any Cheetos in the shape of, like, there a There was that one that was Jesus and it sold. Yep, that's what I thought. Yeah, there is. And I could not believe it. It doesn't look like it. It never does. Oh, it never does. No. Wasn't there, like, a Jesus toast or something, too? Like, where, like, it... Or is it Mary? I think it was Maybe Mary and a toast. Mary. Yeah. People will do and pay weird things. When you have a lot of money, I mean, I guess buy a weird shaped foods. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, start looking start looking start getting creative yes that piece of salmon on your plate might look like oh ew. You bush. ew i'm not buying a piece of salmon that's disgusting unless you encase it in resin no <laughs> All right, Wanderers, thank you so much for listening to another Foolish Wanderers podcast. If you'd like to send us suggestions for future episodes, send us an email at fwplisteners at gmail.com and check out our Instagram for companion images to our episodes. And new episodes of the FWP are out every single Wednesday from wherever you get your podcasts, including this place. And if you'd like, please subscribe, comment, and hit that notifications button. And if you'd like to help us out, you can leave a five-star review. Yeah. All right, Wanderers, we're going to head out. We're going to go check our cereal boxes for things that look like Michael Jackson's face or Elvis's Ew, face. Ew, I don't want to see Michael Jackson's face. <laughs> How about we're for things, cereal pieces that look like Elvis? Is that better? It's better. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you guys next time. Did you ever watch Hannah Montana growing up? Oh, I love that show. Did you ever... Every time I eat beef jerky in the back of my head, I always think of that episode, The Scheme Thing, where Hannah Montana's brother... What was his name? Was it Jackson? Mm-hmm. And then... What was his name? Rico? Yeah. <laughs> they had that yeah. beef jerky with the nacho cheese. Oh, I've always, yeah. In the back of my head, I was like, I wonder if that's really good, because I bet it is. Go try it. Do you have nacho cheese? No, I don't have nacho cheese. Oh, I love nacho cheese. Do you Isn't have it? it in your fridge? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have beef jerky, but I have nacho cheese. You know what? I might have nacho cheese. <laughs> Thinks about it. Hmm. <laughs> You're going to go check? I'm going to wait until after the episode to finish that beef jerky. Okay, save it. Because I'm Save excited it. to put nacho cheese on there. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I have like a Taco Bell brand nacho cheese thing. Okay. Cause I made like um what are those called? Crunch wraps. <gasps> Delicious. I love crunch wraps. hmm I love their cheese, the, the liquid cheese, the nacho cheese. It's that. That's what it is. So good. It's that stuff. That stuff's the best. The fake cheese. <laughs> yeah, it's fake. Fake cheese. Okay. Is this Taco Bell's motto? Because Mr. What? Kendra said it was. Okay. Maybe it was his sister that said that. I don't know. Whoever, somebody of that clan said this. <laughs> but they said that Taco Bell's motto is north of the border. Because it's like, it's such... I it was Liv Moss. Maybe it is. Maybe she was making a joke.
And I missed it. Someone's is. Um, Cause it's good. It's like good, just like cheap, nasty, like American version of Mexican food. Cause I thought it was the maybe it was Taco John's. That was that. I think it's Taco John's. Taco mm. Bell. Okay, so I googled it. Taco, Taco Bell. Taco John sucks. The only thing I like about Taco John's is those potato Olay things. I like the. Um, I used to like the chicken quesadilla. I still do, but they took out the onions and peppers, which makes me very upset. But it's still good. They have good cheese, so I like it. But so Taco Bell's slogan was uh, "Think outside the bun." Now Who is there it's, a bun? Well, instead of like fast food burgers, you know, think outside the burger. It's different fast food it started off as a hot dog stand taco bell didn't it didn't, you did the research on that did i <laughs> yes ma'am okay so oh my anyways gosh. the current slogan is live mas live big. okay okay yep. okay 